And uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming down. I was going to say you should all like get to get move the chairs to the middle here, <laughs> but uh, um, no, that's fine. It's just you know I don't want to leave anybody out. So uh, yeah, so a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Walter Capitani. I'm from Ottawa, Canada. I work for a company called Grammatech. We got snazzy new shirts. I wish I had giveaways, but I only have the one, so you can't have it. You can buy it, I guess. That's for sale. But um, I started out my career in embedded software development, uh, doing military radios, and then sort of morphed over into satellite communications, but mostly for more, uh, um, I'll say, boring uh, type initiatives, uh, radio, TV, and cinema distribution, file distribution. So still kind of client server systems, a lot of embedded stuff going on on the satellite side. And then moved out of embedded uh, computing because I got tired of trying to make computers do what I wanted them to do. So moved into product management and took like a hard left into cybersecurity about nine years ago. Um, so yeah, I've been working with a lot of uh, developer centric tools to um, help make your software more secure and have of higher quality and you know basically shift left into the development cycle things that traditionally even like QA right we're done at the end or security we're done at the end we're trying to promote shifting left into the development cycle find bugs find vulnerabilities earlier and uh, and that way make more secure software so uh, that's a little about me a little bit about Grammatech Grammatech is a 30 year old uh, company of nerds quite frankly uh, originated out of Cornell's computer science program good good kind of nerds though the kind of nerds we like and um, they were uh, computer science professors specializing in language grammar, hence the Grandma Tech name. Very inspired choice. Um, my kids tease me that it's Grandma Tech, but that's okay. And uh, tech for grandmas. So um, yeah, so, uh, so Grandma Tech, 30 years old, focused a lot on research of security and cybersecurity. So doing a lot of contracts, contracts for the federal government here in the United States, uh, some classified work. And then some of that technology has trickled out into the products division of which I'm a part of. Two years ago, the founders decided to retire. They were getting on in age, so they sold the company. And the new owners definitely have more of a product focus. So before, I'd say like the emphasis and you know kind of attention was 70% research, 30% products. Now it's 50-50, so the research division is still going strong. They haven't really lost anything, but the product side has gotten a boost. And so. Uh, our, our flagship product that's been in the market for over 10 years is a product called Code Sonar, and we've introduced a new, which is a static uh, application security testing product, and then we've introduced a new tool in the recent years as part of this new uh, thrust on products to do software composition analysis. So we'll be talking about how we can integrate tools like that into our SDLC. I'm clicking, just to make sure I've got to give it a better click. There we go. So here's our brief agenda for today, and uh, the clock is showing me like, oh, it's upside down. Clock's upside down, just FYI. I'm supposed to read it upside down. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, so, uh, so this is the agenda. We'll talk about planning, starting to plan out your application security strategy, uh, implementations, let's say around development and security, how we want to uh, improve that aspect. Talk about um, CI and CD. And then our post-development acti activities and attestation. Oh, thanks, I appreciate that. I don't know what happened. Nobody, come, no other speaker complained about it, I guess. <laughs> anyway, thank you. And then next steps, uh, probably my competitor came in here or something and did that to mess me up. <laughs> and then some next steps uh, as we as we go forward with, with these implementations. Uh, we'll do questions at the end. I'm, I'm sure we'll have time, so let's jump into it. So before we talk about the four steps, let's talk about why we're here. So, you know, my main mission, what I enjoy doing is seeing software come out of the gate that is, you know, bug-free, vulnerability-free. And, you know, that's sort of, uh, people always say, oh, you can't make bug-free software. And, you know, to a certain degree, they're right. It's very difficult to make bug-free software. But I've, you know, my personal philosophy, and as, you know, as somebody who has written code for a living, uh, you know, I have written a function that was bug-free. I have written an application that behaved as intended without bugs. So why can't we set our target to 100% meets the requirements, right? Sure, if you show me some unintended input, maybe I might malfunction, not ideal, but, I feel like bug-free should be our goal. Vulnerability-free should be our goal. So to do that, we have to put some effort into it, right? Um, did anybody see the keynote this morning from uh, from Tom? Uh, I think his name is Tom. Tom or Tim Brown from um, Oh, I'm blanking on the name. Not Colonial, but the other guys, uh, uh, SolarWinds. And he was, and you know, I really appreciated his candidness, right? I mean, it takes guts to come on stage and say, "Here's how we failed horribly, and here's what we did to fix it." You know, I think that really took guts, so I applaud them for that, for sending him out to talk about it, and him for being so frank. But you know, they spent six months retooling their uh, software development lifecycle in order and their process in order to improve, 
I hope they, they'll probably think insure, which is the right approach, but to insure security. Six months of not shipping features to get better security, right? So there is an effort required and you can either do it ahead of time or you can do it after when your CEO is on the news explaining why you know everybody's data is in the public eye or why a pipeline is shut down or all sorts of good stuff, right? So to me, I think it's a good idea if we do it before. So we're gonna talk about how we can build safer, more secure products. That's, what, that's why we're here. Make it easier for de developers to do that. Increase our quality at the same time because it's sort of a freebie if we're using tools anyway. And then last but not least, accelerate the development cycle and the remediation cycle because we know vulnerabilities will be discovered in these pieces of software that we're using and integrating and building. So the idea that there's no remediation, that we're always gonna be ready to do remediation, but how can we make it easy? So there we go. So then the next part of this then is before you get started is, do you know what's in your software, right? So what weaknesses have your developers put in there? What code have they borrowed or copied or included from a development kit? You know, we were just talking about, you know, the Cunex Blackberry Sync 3, right? So how many parts of Sync 3 were from a development kit that were designed for hardware interfacing or that kind of thing. I'm sure lots of it, right? Because that's why you used it, <laughs> you know? Um, so so what do you know about that code? And then in terms of the, the binaries that you're including, what do you know about the open source or other components that are in the binaries that you've included? Um, and that's just what your developers have done. Now what about your suppliers, right? The suppliers who have, you've, you've purchased something from them, an image processing library, a Bluetooth library, any kind of, you know, Windows DLL you might be using, how do you know what's in there and what vulnerabilities might be in there? So that's, that's part of the, the start of, of improving security is knowing what's in your software. So let's go to step one of this, which is planning. So planning I the introduction of these, you know, the, the, the tools into the software lifecycle. So we talk about what kind of software you have. Is it created equally, right? And the answer is no, right? You've got have you got a highly containerized platform? Do you have a system with, you know, a million endpoints like that and monitoring PCs in a, in a system, in an in a enterprise, for example? Do you, are you supporting mo mobile devices, embedded devices, or do you have firmware, right? So that's the first thing you've got to understand is what's the set of environments we are need to handle here? Uh, the next part is how critical is this software, right? So in the pipeline, Colonial Pipeline situation, the software that was compromised was not the pipeline control software, it was the commercial software, right? They, the, the issue wasn't that they couldn't operate the pipeline, is they couldn't do so commercially effectively, right? And they shut it down because they wanted to be on the safe side, but that was never really at risk, as uh, he was telling us, Adam was telling us this morning, which is great to hear. Um, so is it a mission critical system to a business where the business is going to go bankrupt, right? Or is it a safety critical system or is it both? So what are we trying to protect against? Then we look at the languages side, right? Which is important because not all languages are created equal, right? Some languages have much more sophisticated tools available to them. And some of those tools are the ones we want to use to analyze our software and understand either what's in it or how it behaves. Whereas some other tools, and I'm you know, sort of calling out JavaScript and Python here, they don't always have as sophisticated tools because they're not really compiled languages, right? So there's not this step where you say, I take all the source code and I turn it into something and I can compare those two things. I have the source code and that's all I have, right? And it runs when it runs. And so if you're using interpretive languages, be aware if you're starting a program from the start that you may not have the kind of tools you want for those interpretive languages that you might have for a compiled language. So be careful where you choose to apply those things. And that doesn't mean I'm not a fan of JavaScript or Python. I think they have a great place in, in, in our industry, but we do have to be careful how we use them because you could be in a situation where you've built something mission critical on top of a language that you can't validate in a mission critical way. And that's just something to be careful of. And everybody's guilty of it, right? Because you know how to do something in a certain set of tools and you solve the problem with what you know, even though what you know is not appropriate for the solution. Everybody's done it. They call it a prototype. Next thing you know, it's version 1.0. So we've all been there, right? So it's not a criticism, but we've got to consider that and decide whether we're going down that road or worse, we might've inherited a million lines of Python. So then, then what do you do? Uh, and then last but not least is where does the software come from, right? Because different, you know, provenance of software from different places might require different checks, right? So is it all internally built according to your processes? And so you can assume certain things about the software that you at least want to validate, but you know, you can suggest it's been done in a proper way. 
um, you know, that's all the way down to a criminal element, right? Like, have all your employees gone through a criminal record check? Do they all reside in a certain legal country or place where you can enforce certain things versus are they all subcontractors that you hired on, you know, Amazon and you don't know anything about these folks, right? So there's the provenance of the developers, the software they've created, and then what have you outsourced? What have you outsourced to a third party um, as a module? How have you outsourced it? What control do you have over that quality? And then finally, open source or third party, you know, acquired binaries, what, what's their source? So based on those different sources, again, you're going to want to adjust your strategy accordingly. So why, you know, why are we doing this? Why, what, are the, what are we trying to combat here, right? So I really want to speak to the triangle because I like the triangle a lot, right? At the top, we have threats, right? So Gartner has released research suggesting that by 2025, 50% of organizations w will have in, been subject to a supply chain attack, a software supply chain attack. So either a, um, you know, a typo squatting type package attack or, you know, what, what sort of what happened to, you know, to SolarWinds that they've got a binary, a malware binary inserted in their software, right? That 50%. So that's the number one thing we're trying to guard against as we go ahead here is threats to our software supply chain, right? The next is the vulnerabilities, right? how do we know that the software we have does not have um, exploitable vulnerabilities in it? So that's the next thing we're trying to guard against. And then the last is this quality and compliance aspect. How do we prove it, right? So um, there was, uh, you know, a, a recent order came out from the OMB uh, talking about um, self-attestations of software. We're gonna talk a little bit about that towards the end. But how can we prove to somebody pr purchasing our software that we've developed it in a proper way? And that's the last element of this triangle. It's fine that you did it, you know, you guarded against threats, that you understand the vulnerabilities, but now you've got to prove it to somebody, right? So you're, not, you're going to take your word for it. How are we going to be able to do that? What tools do we need to prove that? So, so that quality and compliance aspect is the other reason that we're doing this. So the last part of the planning is, do you have the tools? So a bit of an inventory that you need to look at is what tools do you have in-house already, right? Do you have tools for static application security testing that can analyze your source code and look for bad behavior? Um, you know, and there's lots of tools out there that do this, right? There's free tools, there's pay tools, there's complicated tools, there's, you know, tools that run forever and give you fantastic results. There's compromises you can make. At the end of the day, there's a whole spread of static application security testing out there. What do you have? Is it applicable? If we go back to that two slides ago, is it applicable to your environments, applicable to your languages? Do you have blind spots? What do you need to acquire in order to go forward with this? So that's the first aspect of it, to get the source code that you generate and that you have from suppliers, let's say, analyzed for weaknesses and quality issues. Then the second aspect is software composition analysis. Can you find out what is in your software from an open source and vulnerability perspective, a licensed perspective, both in your source code and your binary code? Do you have a way to do that? So I was really happy to hear um, the gentleman from, uh, why well, am I keep forgetting the name of his company? SolarWinds. Uh, the gentleman from SolarWinds talk about how now they're compiling their source code. They're doing everything from source code and then they're verifying the binaries match the source code. That that's what they, what they find in the binaries, what they expect from the source code. And they weren't doing that before, right? And somebody inserted something, some binary code in their software that they didn't have any idea uh, how, where it came from and they had no way of verifying that it was even there. They just had no way of knowing that. So um, that's a good task for software composition analysis to help you understand that the artifacts of your output actually are from your input. And again, it sounds super trivial, right? But who here has ever looked at a build script and wondered what's really happening in there? Like where there's this like copy statement and there's a include this and there's a bunch of flags. and you know that guy who used to work here did the build script? Yeah, I don't know, he figured it out, right? Like how many of us have had that experience, right? So, you know, and I, and I joke about it because I've been into companies where we're trying to do a demo sometimes and nobody wants to touch the build script to help us do our demo because nobody really knows how it works, right? They're just kind of like, it works. You know, we do this and we get our installer and it works and we're happy with that, right? And it's, you know, not ideal, but it happens. Or, or they have a new guy and he knows 90% of it or she or whoever, you know, knows 90% of it. But there's that 10% where they're like, yeah, I inherited this little file and I just let it go, you know? So, so that's the problem with our business, right? Is we don't have a standard for documenting that. We don't treat that process like a product, unfortunately, and we should. And we're all guilty of it. I think anybody who's been doing this for a long time has done it at one time or the other. Um, so software composition analysis can help with that. And then last but not least, what about switches and flags and 
uh, you know, really hardening techniques on the binaries, are you verifying that those, or do you have a way of verifying that those techniques have in fact been turned on? Who's checking that ASLR is turned on? Who's checking, you know? Um, who's checking that, you know, insecure functions are not being used? Is a person checking that or are you just hoping that nobody's using it? Do you have a way of knowing? And so these are tools that you can use to sort of trust but verify, but when it comes to attestation, you can say, well, look, here's the output of all these automated tools that have proven what we think we know. We've, we can demonstrate it now. All right, so here's an overview. Now we've gone kind of through the background material of these, the four steps. So, you know, I'm gonna disclaim this, right? There's lots more steps that you could insert into this process, right? What we're trying to talk about today is how we can improve software security and quality. That's what we're focused in on, right? So even when it comes to tools, right? If you've got more tools that you can throw at this, by all means, I, I include those here. You know, I'm referring to some specific technologies that I'm familiar with, but there's all sorts of other technologies. And I would never say it's a bad idea to use one over the other. If you've got the budget, the time, by all means, use more. So that's you know my, my recommendation, always use more. So step one is in the development life cycle, right? The first half of it's in the development life cycle. This is where we're going to do automated source checking as a way of validating the code that we're writing. So a developer's writing code, who here is a former developer or a current developer? Enough? Yeah, former or current? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so so. Everybody's done something, right? So, you know, when you write code on your own, your little home project or something, right, you have no code review. You do the code review, right? Now we're going to add, of course, hopefully a code review in there, a step, a senior person who's going to look and say, yeah, that shouldn't break anything. Yeah, you've followed our coding standards. That's great, right? So what are we doing the SAST for? The SAST is, is the next code reviewer, which is going to say, here's the part you didn't know because the guy that wrote the code over there that you're calling left the business three years ago and you don't know how that code works. And it just works, so nobody keeps looking at it. But we'll tell you if you're going to cause a memory leak over there. We'll tell you if you're going to pass a data value that's too big or something like that. So that's what SAS is going to help us with, right? Then the next step is, okay, you've built a bunch of software that you as a developer are going to test. So that's you know, in our development life cycle. You're going to test. We want to scan those binaries, right? Because yesterday log4j got reported it just happened yesterday and so we're going to scan your binary and immediately flag to you hey in your binary library that you included that you never wrote that you never touched you now have a vulnerability so you've got a problem that either you can see now or you can see when you release right and this is the shift left mentality we want to see it today right so if you were writing software on december 23rd of this year sorry of 2021 and you compiled it and you had an SCA tool analyzing your binaries, it would have flagged that for you. It would have said, hey, you've got, you know, I think it was released on December 7th, right? Something like that, but you've got log4j with a critical vulnerability in it now. Stop what you're doing and fix that, right? And that would have prevented you from releasing software potentially with a vulnerability in it, right? And I think that's, that's really key because you've got to do some work to remediate it. You've got to then retest everything. So it takes time. If you only find out when you've published, that's terrible. So that's what we're going to do in the development side is check what your developers are doing every day. Then we move to the post-development activities, right? So the post-development activities involve the sort of final package that you're going to de deploy. So if you think about it, developers don't always recompile and rebuild everything. They're kind of using an infrastructure or a test setup, right, That's that works, and then they're putting new binaries on top of it, and so it's sort of a mishmash. And then we do a release candidate, so your release candidate's sort of over on side three, where, hey, I got a release candidate, now we're doing our release candidate testing, we should also scan that release candidate, right? To make sure there's nothing that goes weird in the build between when developers do their code and when we've got the release candidate. And that's what SolarWinds is doing now. And then finally, in the fourth uh, step, that's where we're doing our validation and our communication externally, our attestation, right? We're saying, okay, here's our SBOM, here's our vulnerabilities, here's what we know, here's our license information, we're good to go with the release. So if we zoom into the development part of this, so the first rule of thumb here is don't slow down your development workflows, right? There's nothing developers hate more than not being able to write code. So what we want to do is enable those developers to write secure and high quality code without standing in their way. So the key there is DevSecOps and CI, CD, sorry for the typo, CI, CD tools and processes. That's the key, is we're going to integrate our SAST tools that find defects and vulnerabilities in the actual code that your developers are writing. We're integrating those into our CI, CD process so you've got that vulnerability or weakness is identified right away. And so when we deploy a tool like SAST into an environment, um, I don't know if anyone here has experience with that, but it's very common Let's say you got a million line of code 
you run a new SAST tool on your code and you get 10,000 warnings. Very common, right? And so then, of course, your developers will throw up their hands and say, well, what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to stop working for six months while we fix all these issues, right, or correct them or triage them? And our answer to that is no, don't do that. What you should say to yourself is, well, we know how good our quality is and we know how good our security is. Now we have a bunch of new findings. If the reason we deployed this tool is because we want to improve quality, then we should decide what quality issues we want to improve, go after those. And everything else we should just leave because we know how good our, hopefully our quality is not so bad that you know we're in a bad situation. And I, had a, I worked with a customer once, I don't want to name them, but let's just say they make a very popular action camera. And they had outsourced one of their action camera to, to hit the market faster. They outsourced the software and it was terrible. The camera was crashing all the time, rebooting all the time. And they had outsourced the whole software development. So what they did is they bought a SaaS tool, deployed it, and they just told the subcontractor, fix everything, <laughs> right? You'll fix everything because you haven't been able to fix the software first, right? And obviously you wouldn't want to do that to your own employees, but clearly they didn't care because you know they, they didn't meet the contract requirements. So they just said, fix it. You keep fixing until we tell you it works, right? And so if you already have a product that works at a good level, you can to a certain degree ignore that legacy stuff unless it's causing you problems. You have a lot of crashes in a certain module. Well, go look at those then, right? But everything else, leave it alone. What you really want to focus on is what we call the primary goal there. New code should be secure. Don't introduce new vulnerabilities. Don't introduce new quality issues. That's the key here. And, and I'm talking a lot about quality because you know the availability aspect of a piece of software, right? If you have a system that's supposed to provide secure communication and that system crashes every hour, what are people going to do? They're gonna find a different way to communicate that's not secure, right? So the security of that overall process depends on your system working. So a quality issue can quickly become a security issue. Um, so the primary goal, make sure new code secure meets the quality standards that you have. And then your secondary goal should be go back into the legacy code and either look for things that maybe have exploits available or that you know are high probability of being exploited and fix those issues. So when we look at SAS testing in a CI CD environment, this is sort of an example with GitLab. So this, uh, this slide is a typical GitLab diagram that they have. So thanks to GitLab, credit to GitLab. And, uh, and you see here you've got, I'm a, sorry, it's no pointer here, so I'm going to point manually. Um, you know, you've got your developer here who's created a new branch and they've gone off and they've created some code changes and then they've done this usual build step that we're all familiar with and then they've done a few fixes, more builds, review, do a code review and merge, right? And so in that step, you know, they've also done some developer testing, right? No developer writes code and doesn't see if it works, right? Unless they can't. Um, so they've hopefully been able to verify that it works, right? And let me know when you're done your picture so I won't click because there's another slide coming. Okay, so then what we want to do here is focus in on the build and test, right? And so what we're going to do is in this build and test circle, we're going to deploy our SAST tool. We're going to put it right here, right? So the number of code changes that are being analyzed from the baseline are very small. Maybe the developer's written 100, 200 lines of code before they have attempted this, right? But because we can do a whole program analysis, what we can do is say, hey, yeah, you've your, your code has bad things in it. You're calling some other code and causing some bad things to happen. And where's that developer's head at, right? Well, that developer's head is right in the code they just wrote. They just wrote it. There's that timeliness. Like they wrote it yesterday. They compiled it, you know, overnight, let's say, and they've come in in the morning and got a bunch of warnings. If those warnings appear in GitLab, it's almost trivial for the developer to fix things at this point because there's no inertia here, right? They haven't written another 200 lines of code on top of it, right? It's right there in front of them. And this is why shift left is so important because, you know, and it's not a brand new concept, but it's, it's, it's working its way through all the tools now is pull that information to the developer sooner. So in many mission critical applications, the tradition was build the code and then do analysis at the end, right? And then fix. And so this is the classic waterfall model. Somebody says, how long? And you said, I don't know, I've got a thousand defects, right? So I don't know how long it takes to fix a thousand. But if someone asks you how many defects do we have today? And you say, I have one, right? Well, how long does one defect take? A week. So I can say in a week, I'm back to no defects, right? And that's the issue here is keep yourself defect free so you never have that big backlog of defects to then say, well, it's either released tomorrow or release in some undetermined amount of time. And that's the problem we all face as software developers. So the goal here is move that SaaS activity into the nightly builds, into every branch build, have a you know, zero tolerance policy fundamentally for security weaknesses or critical software issues uh, around reliability and fix them right away. Right? And then it's easy for the developer if they can see it in the tool. So it's critical if you choose a tool 
try not to choose a tool that has to make them go to another interface to see it. If it's if Jira is the interface, put the e issues in Jira. If GitLab's the interface, put the issues in GitLab. GitLab has a beautiful security interface, by the way. I should have put a screenshot, but I forgot. But a very nice security interface that third-party tools can actually put their defects into, so the developer doesn't have to leave um, doesn't have to leave GitLab. The, in the background, the tool's got to run, but it can put its its issues right in GitLab. And so, highly recommend it if you're using something like that. And I have no affiliation with GitLab, by the way. Our tool is compatible with a bunch of different environments. Just they have a nice picture. They have the nicest diagram <laughs> that I could steal. All right. So. Then the next step in our development process is the SCA test, so software composition test. So developers written as code, and sorry for the art of pronouns, his, her code. Um, developers written it, now they've compiled it, and they're putting that code on their development desktop and doing some testing. We want to test those binaries, right? We want to make sure that that initial build step does not mask something. So imagine if your developer says, oh, I've upgraded log4j, and then you do the SCA on their binaries, and the old log4j is still showing up. That could totally happen, right? Because log4j is not something they wrote, it's not something they compiled, it's something they're grabbing, and they modified whoever was in charge of bringing in the new log4j didn't do it right. These things happen, right? And again, you might find out before release, but you'd rather find out today than two months from today. So focus on those binaries that have changed as part of this you know, development process, and identify vulnerable open source components, any license issues. So open source licenses change over time. So for all you know, a project has, I've seen this before, a project gets forked into two open source projects because the developers can't agree on what direction to take it. And one of them gets a more restrictive license than another. And so you don't know which one you're using. Maybe, you know, they flipped a coin to decide who keeps the old name and it's the more restrictive license that's got the old name, something like that, right? And so suddenly you've gone from an open source license that you could distribute easily in your code to this open source license that's too restrictive. Um, so that's the other thing you want to look at is vulnerabilities with the components, license issues with the components. And again, you're looking at first party code. So we're interested in source code SCA as well as vendors and third party code where we're looking at binary SCA, right? And binary SCA, of course, is the only one that can do everything. But if you have access to source SCA, no reason not to use it. And again, our priority here should be remediation of components with known exploits. So there's a lot of vulnerabilities out there that are reported, but there are either no known, known exploits, so you can't just go on the dark web and find one, right? Or they're laboratory exploits. They're not real exploits, right? So if you have an SCA tool that can shed some light on what the exploits are, then you can make a more reasoned decision about how real is this exploit. It also can tell you if you've got vulnerability information in the tool, it can help you understand um, what, the, what the vector is for exploit. Is it network or is it local, that kind of thing? Because a lot of companies, you know, organizations could quite say, you don't have local access to this software ever. You have to be on it, like, you know, there's physical restrictions, whatever. So if it, don't, if it requires local access, it's not really, we're not vulnerable to it. So these are the things the SCA tests can tell you. And yeah, I talked about source and binary SCA, so I can skip this slide. All right, so let's talk about the post-development tasks now. So the first is we want to generate our software bill of materials and our reports. So our reports would include vulnerability reports, exploit data, license information. And this is where what we're going to do, though, is we're going to do this on our final package. So now we've finished our development. We've done a packaging step. Um, I'm old enough that I've got a lot of Windows installer stuff, and we never generated our Windows installers until we had got new code. Like we didn't do that step on every nightly build. We should have, we were, we were naive. It was the 2000s, you know, <laughs> you could do that kind of thing. But, but yeah, we were so busy writing code and it took so long to compile. Nobody wanted to do the packaging step. We'll just, no, we'll just compile the code. We'll test the code. And when the code works, then we'll package it in Windows. We'll do a quick smoke test on the Windows installer, like try and install it. And that's good, we're done, right? So if something got in the way there, and, and some of those Windows installers are quite convoluted, right? They're, they're a, they're, it's like a, a product unto itself to understand how to use it. You could easily make a mistake there, include the wrong thing. It could be so simple as just including the wrong version of um, you know, .NET or something like that, right? So you could include the wrong version of that and suddenly you, know, you might just have a quality issue, but you could also have a security issue. So that's what we want to review in order to generate our, our artifacts that we need for our own record keeping and then for the next step, of course, which is for compliance, right? So, so we're gonna kind of diverge off here a little bit into this SBOM discussion, because I think this is really timely and very important. So everybody 
has everybody heard of this Office of Memorandum and Budget? It's a very convoluted name. We're over there on the right. Well, that memo just came out in early September, but that memo dates back to it. I felt really bad. I saw the SolarWinds guy on the, planet, plan, on the uh, panel this morning, and I thought, oh man, I got him on my slides. But, <laughs> but I think he's, he's moved on, <laughs> so it's good. But you know, SolarWinds happened, right? Then Log4j happened. Then ransomware happened at Colonial Pipeline, and, and all these bad things kept happening. I don't know if you guys heard the latest. There was a school board that their kids' data was stolen. They said, pay the ransom. Also, we're putting all the data on the dark web, and it's all that biographical information that you can use to build a credit profile, right? And I'm like, all oh, these poor kids are all going to need to you know, get a credit protection 10 years from now or something like that. But all these things kept happening. So in, result, in, in, re in response, right, we had the executive order on improving cybersecurity. We had the improved NIST security guidelines, 800 to 18 guidelines for developing secure software came out. Then we had the CISA uh, report on secure software. OWASP makes its own recommendations. All these things are happening. And then the OMB memo. So the OMB memo is that vendors are going to have to demonstrate that they are compliant with secure software uh, development practices, right? And anybody who's in safety critical, who's done you know automotive or aerospace type development or other safety critical, nuclear energy, we have standards in those industries that the industries have agreed upon. Here's a process that you achieve ISO compliance and tell us how your software is safe to use, right? But there really wasn't an equivalent like that anywhere on the security side. There wasn't like an ISO process for saying it's secure. And, and a lot of those safety critical um, standards have added cybersecurity, like MISRA rules for automotive. They've added cybersecurity into that. But it's a, it's a Band-Aid, right? They're, they're just sticking it on top of, no, no criticism to them, but they're sticking it on top of a safety critical standard, right? And so it's it, the processes that companies have may not be suitable for cybersecurity, right? It's just they have nothing else. They got to do something, and I, I, I applaud them doing something. But now we've got the U.S. government saying, no, we're going to do something. And obviously, and also the EU, sorry, if you see there, there's the EU Cyber Resilience Act that's coming in as well. Um, so yes, yeah, so this slide, this is a bit of an eye chart, but it basically breaks down the OMB memo. So who does it impact? It impacts anybody selling software or products containing software to the federal government. So that's bad, that's everybody, right? And uh, includes firmware um, and anything that is you know, not hardware. And then what actions do you have to do? You have to self attest that you are in compliance with specific security practices such as the NIST guidelines. And this may include you pro providing a software bill of materials. So again, you can provide a software bill of materials through um, you know, a, a manual process, but that manual process of course is expensive to do and could be error prone. So you can also use automated tools to do that, right? Or a combination of both. But ultimately you're telling the government, we know what's in our software and we stand by it based on this software bill of materials. Um, and the timeline, uh, you can see in the third third bullet there, um, the timeline is not that far away. So by the end of the year, of a year from when this memo came out, if you release a new product, so somebody buys a new product, any federal agency buys a new product, or any federal agency updates to a new major version of the product, they're going to require this self-attestation, which means you may need to be able to produce a credible software bill of materials and VEX file by that time. So. You know, I, I don't know how many people are not building software that goes to the federal government, and I'd be curious to talk to people in specific verticals who have already looked at this. Um, like I'm thinking maybe automotive, like, you know, do they consider that a piece of software or do they just bundle it under safety because it's improved by a dozen, you know, a dozen different agencies? I kind of wonder, but certainly for any tools, uh, even our own tools at Gramatech, you know, this, this affects us, right? That we've, we've got to do this. So then the last step, uh, getting back on track to our four steps, is this disclosure part, the self-attestation part, right? So you've got to have all your documentation prepared. You've got to be able to substantiate how that documentation was generated. You want to disclose your vulnerabilities and any information around that about how it's mitigated, for example, um, and that software bill of materials. Okay, so quick summary, right? What are we going to do? We're going to apply SAST to our software that we're developing and source code that we're getting from other vendors. We're going to analyze in our build time environment, we're going to analyze our uh, binary that is generated as part of our daily development and verify licensing information, component versions, and vulnerabilities. 
Then we're going to start creating in the post-development phase our documentation and doing full tests on our full package that we're developing. And then last but not least, we're going to release this information as part of our, a part of our communication to customers. So then we take a look at next steps. So after we've, you know, you leave here, if this is something that you're looking at implementing, right? The first thing you probably want to do is take an inventory of software, everything that you're producing, everything that you're bringing in from external sources, right? And then the biggest thing here, the biggest point, if I could tell you, encourage you to do anything when you take away is in the context of the OMB uh, guidelines coming out is take a look at the application security tools and practices but from the context of the third party risk and compliance, how, how can we prove that our third party risk is negligible or quantify our third party risk? And how could we fill out a self attestation that says we're doing this properly, right? So you may have the tools, right? And you may have the practices uh, or some practices, but they may not address this issue. So that's my, if you take away one thing from this talk, it's please take a look at that because it's coming in less than you know, 12 months now. And then last but not least is monitor emerging directives and requirements. So I expect these things will change. The requirements will change what artifacts are required, like an SBOM. They may become more specific in terms of what versions. Uh, I'll put in a plug for our blog because our marketing team does a terrific job of breaking down these new rulings. Um, we're, we're, you know, otherwise, other than our head office being located here in Bethesda, Maryland, it's a very big interest to us corporately what's going on in this arena. So, um, so if, if, if you come over to the blog, you can get some breakdowns and what you need. So some useful information there. Uh, but that would be the other big takeaway is, is get plugged into it because it's changing right now. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Go ahead. I would vote on multiple, so, and here's why. Here's why I'd vote on multiple tools. So let's take a field I'm very familiar with is the SaaS space, static analysis. Every tool has a certain amount of uncertainty, right, if it's a static tool, because it's not running your code. So if we're all developers, I apologize for nerding out a little bit, but one of the fun things in static analysis is analyzing a loop. How do you analyze a loop that says for i equals 1 to 1,000, do the following? Because if you run that loop a thousand times, your analysis takes however time that loops takes to run. What if it's for i equals one to a million? What if it's for i equals one to infinity? Like it's a loop that's waiting for you to push a button, right? So as soon as you get to that stage, the loop that's waiting for you to push a button, all static testing tools now have to make an approximation and a model of that behavior and attempt to figure out what that code is could do wrong during that infinite number of loops that it's going to run, right? And so if you have one tool, you only get one approximation and you might miss something. Right? Or if you have two tools, you might get one that reports something that's not going to happen, a false positive, and one that doesn't report it, but it reports something different that is a true positive. So I would highly recommend two tools. Many industries require two tools, such as aerospace. They require two static analysis tools, for example, on their code. So Are there a limit the limit is how many people you want to spend managing those tools. And I wouldn't say the limit's the results. I've certainly, I've seen implementations, large organizations where they run the results through a filter and they only look at matching results. So they look at more than one tool has to report the result before they look at it. Those are their high priority results. And then if they have none of those, they'll start investigating the lower quality ones, right? It's very industry dependent. It's very dependent on what are you worried about and what are you hearing, right? Like, are you hearing that your product crashes a lot? Maybe you wanna, or you know you have uh, out of memory issues or memory leak issues. So you might run two tools and look for that. So the limit is practicality, right? If you can automate the tools and you can automate the responses of, like the outputs of those tools in order to aggregate them efficiently, there may be no practical limit, right? The other one is processing power and time. So that's why, you know, we're looking, I would encourage you to look at SaaS tools, for example because that way the scaling someone else's problem and not your problem, right? So a lot of these build environments now can be moved to the cloud. And so you can say, yeah, run like GitLab as an example, you could run multiple SaaS tools easily as GitLab runners on whatever infrastructure you want. So yeah, no problem, you're welcome. Thanks for the question. Anyone else? Oh, sure. Yeah, 
ideally it's pre-commit for sure it's pre-commit i mean um certainly we've done a lot of integrations of our SaaS tool in that kind of way where you're on your branch and you're just working against your own branch right and yeah also ide tools are another great way uh, code sonar does offer an ide tool so that you can view results right in the ide as you're working before you and, and a lot of tools do not just code sonar um so yeah ideally if you can do it pre-commit that's better because that way when you go to do the code review stage you've already been through that initial you know vulnerability checking and code quality checking in an automated way so yeah if you can if you can i would now the binaries is kind of tricky because you've got to build it right so then a binary analysis requires a build so then you might put that as post commit i've often heard described as a lot of tests i don't really know right yeah that's fine that's test tools have different you tune it differently so there's an that's right one that's quick there's the spell check yeah and then when you do commits it's, it's a little bit bigger and you do a bigger one with the builds because you want to interrupt the developer in their process right but the advantage of having one in id at least drops security is now you have an educational opportunity so that's right now the developer can say well how do i fix the cross-site scripting oh mm -hmm. i click this button it shows me my code should look like this is quick here we have five minutes and now i learn yeah right and that's not so useful later even if there's still memory within that shell right still not as easy to learn as right now and it makes it safe and easy to use later yeah, so it's interesting that you say that. So it's funny, I was going to say you must have used my previous product, company's product because they had that feature. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, the, the autocorrect is an interesting one because we, we, we liked it a lot. But one of the, one of the challenges, th this I ran into at Nokia, I'm sure they wouldn't mind me talking about this. Um, we went to see them and said, how's it going with developer desktop compiling and IDE work, right? Because in order to, the trick with a lot of SaaS tools is they have to actually do a compilation in the background. In order to do... They don't just, not, like it's different with JavaScript and Python because they're interpreted, but with a lot of compiled languages, in order to get a result, you have to be able to compile. So either that file or the whole project. And then the Nokia guy looked at me and he said, we're done with desktop. Oh, okay, why are you done with desktop? He's like, it's your IDE stuff, we don't care about it anymore. And I said, why? And he said, because we have to maintain 8,000 software packages on every developer's workstation. The, 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 the job of maintaining the packages has overwhelmed us. So we're going to a, you can edit code on anything you want, but all of the builds are going centralized, right? And so they had to move away from IDEs because of they want to centralize the builds to make the package management easier, and they also wanted to scale the build system rather than just buy more expensive laptops. So that's the challenge with IDE, is if you can compile locally, so small embedded systems, that kind of thing, it's perfect, right? But as soon as you get to large systems, so like infotainment systems can be quite big, then the challenge is, can you compile that infotainment system in an environment that lets you use it on an IDE? So then the warnings you can get in the ID are sort of limited that way with, with compiled languages. That's my but exception. There's not, but there's none of that trick with this. Yeah. Some SAS tools, I won't go into it, I mean, this is kind of yeah. confirmed with plenty of things. It's, it's, there's ways of doing semantic analysis and breaking these down into symbols. Yep. And you can look at it from a symbol, symbolic and mathematical basis where you do not have to actually create a binary to run it. You can execute the underlying, um, this is the thing I said before, it's like going back yeah. to mathematical proof. That there are some tools that will break it down you lose the language concept on some of them, the, the, the possibilities of that. There are tools that try to completely. Wait, wait, sorry, I should say when I say compiling it, what I mean is you need the all the code to build it. You need to understand what it's calling, right? Because it might use a library that's somewhere off. You don't actually have to build a binary, but you have to have enough information to know how that binary would go together, right? And so, yes, if you've got all the source code in one file, then it's fine, you can do that, right? But the issue is most projects are not like that. So that, that's the challenge. Um, but it's an interesting challenge that people are balancing act because I agree with you, the IDE teaching is fantastic. Um, the key is can you integrate that kind of teaching and that immediacy into something that's running through a GitLab? Is that enough immediacy? Can you do that? You know, and if you can, then maybe you can bridge that gap a bit. But I do agree with you, the IDE stuff is fantastic. Not, I 100% agree. <laughs> Anyone else? I think I saw a question over here. No? Okay. Well, if everybody just came in, you missed a fantastic uh, dissertation. <laughs> Anyways, thanks very much. I appreciate it. Pleasure being here.